We think you should know that Imperfect Heroes Podcast is a production of Little Hearts Academy USA. Welcome, heroes and heroines, to episode 123 of Imperfect Heroes Insights into Parenting, the perfect podcast for imperfect parents looking to find joy in their experience of raising children in an imperfect world. And I'm your host, DJ Stutz. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for choosing to spend the next little bit of time with Imperfect Heroes Podcast. And before we get started, I want to remind everybody that you can find us on YouTube and Rumble. YouTube, we're at Little Hearts Academy USA, and on Rumble, the channel is called Just Imperfect Heroes. And I'm so excited because we have the Cicerone master's class that's going on right now. And it's nice because it's self-paced. So you can watch whenever you want, however it works for you. And you don't have to meet with a schedule that we're doing a bunch of live stuff. And so there's four different modules. Each module has three to six lessons inside. And we are talking about looking at your own parenting and what is your style? What is your personality? What are your triggers? We're also going to be talking about your child in school. And I know that school has just been getting underway and we're in the deep dive of it right now. And so we're gonna talk about social emotional education and we're gonna talk about math and literacy and science and there's more, but that's what I'm hitting on this one. And we're gonna talk about what are the expectations and then what you can do if your child needs a little extra help or if they're doing so well, they need a little extra challenge for their learning. We're gonna help you find out all of these things and it's just so much fun. So if you go to the website, and guess what? The link is in the show notes. But if you just pop down, you can click on the Little Hearts Academy USA. There's also gonna be a link that takes you directly to the class so you can register, do whatever you want, but join us and become a master. You know, a Cicerone, is a mentor and a tour guide and someone who has a lot of knowledge that they are sharing with other people and isn't that what we are for our kids and so we're going to be master cicerones and so join us there now today i'm so excited because we have an amazing guest from down under lynn kendall and we're talking about a topic that's really important and i know we've hit on it before in a way We've talked about resilience in our kids and how to build that resilience in our kids. And we're going to talk about that today. But we're also going to be talking about familial resilience and how to make our whole entire family resilient to some of the things that are going on. You know, we've had wildfires and big things that happened. A few years ago, my son and his family, they lived right by the Paradise Fires that were in Northern California. His in-laws lost their home, it was burned to the ground. And there's a lot of trauma there with the kids and that whole area. Or it could be a car accident. It could be a illness in the family. There's so many things that can cause trauma. But we want our kids to be resilient and to be able to look at those items for what they are and move forward. And Lynn, you're an expert at all of this. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about what you've got? Okay. So... I am in Australia and I'm well known as Resilience Tutor. So over my 30 year career in the education system and in the psychology field, what I discovered was that children there was this struggle in schools and I was seeing these young people struggle. And I thought, what really is this struggle in life, you know? And when I came back down and really boiled down to what that underlying struggle was for them, was them not understanding themselves not understanding their emotions, not understanding their thinking, not understanding how their energy, sometimes not understanding how they fitted in the school because I worked in the schools, sometimes not understanding how they fitted in their family. So, you know, what I decided to do then, because when I first started working in the psychology field, I went, hmm, I actually have to wait for children to have negative life experiences before Mm. they come and see me. That to me just did not add up. 
So putting right. on my teaching hat, because it was a teacher first, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I went, I'm going to create a program that helps children learn about who they are, you know, and learn about how their emotions, their thoughts and their energy connect to every experience that they have. Mm -hmm. And you just hit on that perfect example when you were talking about the wildfires and the trauma mm -hmm. and all of those things, because what we need to do is actually understand that experience. And it's actually not us that understands that experience. It's actually our brain. So when I work mm. with families and young children, what I talk to them about is the brain. Oh, so your brain just reacted this way. They go, yeah, it did. Or I say, your body just reacted this way. And they go, yeah, it did. Because it's understanding how our brain and our body connect and react or act in different situations. Because every new experience that we have is exactly that a new experience yeah. so sometimes what we just don't understand is the experience that we've just had so it all comes down to that experience and really linking in and understanding what did that mean to me or what did that mean to my brain what did that mm -hmm. mean to my body what do I need to now do to fully understand that experience and you bring up such a good idea in that we're kind of separating it from your brain is experiencing this way or is reacting in this way. My body is reacting in this way. I mean, kids can get even shaky. They can That's get it. an upset tummy. They can eat too much or eat too little. There's all kinds of ways that we react. It's very individual. But as you start saying, well, it's your body that's doing that or your brain that's doing that, it helps them kind of separate the reaction it from who they are, correct? Correct. And what that helps with is identity um, because it's not about me. I didn't do that. So therefore then, you know, and I very much work with the unconscious mind and the conscious mind. So if I said mm -hmm. to you, I did that, then the unconscious mind goes, mm, I did that. And it, and it goes into a whole different process where if I say to the unconscious mind, oh, wow, the, my brain just reacted this way. They go, yeah, it, it goes, yeah, it does. And it takes ownership of that. And then it knows how to readjust that part of the process. So we don't have a defensive unconscious mind. We have an unconscious mind that's willing to work with us and understand the process of mm -hmm. what's actually happening for us. So yeah. it's just a different way of looking at it. But mm -hmm. we really get down to the core of what's actually understood happening for our brain because our brain is fascinating i love oh. teaching about the brain <laughs> it is <laughs> isn't it it's best so lessons cool. ever right yeah, yeah well and i see as parents with young kids they oftentimes because we don't really teach it anymore like we used to but they don't understand the typical development of kids and that it happens at different stages and where one yeah. child might develop more quickly maybe verbally another child might develop more quickly in the physical realms and in muscle motor memory and and that and be more athletic some kids are more rule based rule oriented in the way that they relate to their world around them other kids what rules? There's a rule, right? <laughs> That's it. That's it. Oh, what was that thing? <laughs> what was that? My daughter, my middle daughter, I've got five kids and my middle, I had girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. Isn't that hysterical? But my middle child, she has two kids and one is very, very rule based. And the other one, same family, same parents. And yet Iggy is there's a rule what oh that doesn't apply to me that's for the other people right yeah. and uh, and all of that is normal all yeah. of that comes in the realms of normal and so i think part of that in helping our kids coming to understand that is taking that little piece of them that personality that's there what are their strengths what are their weaknesses what scares them and then some kids, it's like, that should scare you. <laughs> <laughs> it. Because all our brains are different. Our brains are actually not the same. And like even in identical twins, when I really looked and studied neuroscience and things like that, do you know, even twins actually have mm. different brains. What they have that is identical for them, which sits in their brains, is their mirror neurons. So they've got that mirror projection between mm -hmm. them. But actually, their brains are still different and they still act and react in different ways. Yeah. So, which is why I love talking and teaching about all, some of the different components of the brain. I don't go into all of them, but some right. of them really help children understand, oh, that was my mirror neurons firing or not firing. Because some children who sit on the autistic spectrum disorder, what they actually have in their brain is actually less mirror neurons. So, they cannot actually read 
our emotions in that way because they can't actually right. have those same mirror neurons because we rely on that communication from our brain to understand what's happening for other people. Right. And sometimes we don't get that message as clearly from our brain as what we'd like to receive it. There's times where we go, oh, you didn't give me that message very clearly. Yeah. You know, so it's just really fascinating when we really understand. And like I love teaching it to children because they're just mm -hmm. so fascinated about their brain and their body. And all of a sudden I've got them healthy eating because they're going, my body and brain needs healthy food, you know. Yeah. So it just puts a whole different conversation mm -hmm. into what's actually happening for that young person's body. And then they take ownership over their body and brain and we just have different conversations in the family, which is really awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I love that. And and you bring up family. It's funny you brought up twins because I have brothers that are identical <laughs> twins. I <laughs> think. Yeah, there you go. yeah, yeah. I'm they're the oldest of the seven, side. and their numbers oh, five wow. and six. Yeah, and it's funny because one is really super good with English and yeah. writing. He's an attorney, and the other one <laughs> is was is really good with science and that kind of. He's yeah. an orthodontist, but they have a lot of things that they have really in common as well. That's right. They had to wind up going shopping together for clothes when they were in high school because if they didn't, they came home very often with the same thing. <laughs> same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so they yeah, had yeah. to go together so they weren't going to get the same things. But um, yeah. So, but it's, yeah, you're right. It's interesting to see the differences even in identical mm -hmm. twins that there's that individuality yeah. that goes on. Um, and yeah. so I love also that you brought up that we're having different conversations with the family now when yeah. we come to those kinds of understanding. And That's so right. when we make resilience part of our family structure, part of our routine, you know, and, I, and yep. there's a difference between being callous and letting kids work it out. Yeah, absolutely. And I talk to young children about small resilience stories, medium mm -hmm. resilience stories, and large resilience stories because every one of us are resilient in different ways. So for some people, something what might seem small, which is what you mentioned before, is actually quite large for somebody else right. because their brain has processed that information quite differently. So mm -hmm. there's different resilient stories within our family, so, which is really great to understand. What does this experience mean to you? it still comes back to that experience but the more we talk around the experiences that we're having because sometimes in our families we just have that experience we don't really discuss it we don't really know and then mm -hmm. it sort of gets buried into our unconscious mind or into our nervous system because our nervous system holds a lot of our experiences that we have and even our unresolved experiences our nervous system also holds those experiences so as part of one of the family routines i love doing is we actually tune in the nervous system which is so cool and we don't talk about that enough so now yeah. i have children in family saying hang on mom i just need to tune in my nervous system before i go and do this you know because that's exactly what we need but we're not used to talking about our body and our brain in that way right. but all he was saying was hang on mom put the brakes on a minute, I need to tune myself in. And I talk to it a bit like tuning in a car. We know that we need to go and tune in our car when it, before it breaks down. So right. it's in good running order all of the right. time, especially right. for me, because I'm not a good mechanic. So I need to <laughs> make <either> sure <laughs> <laughs> that car is running well for when I get in there and do my driving. Yeah. And I talk to, <laughs> so we talk to the kids in the same way. We're just going to tune in their body. But we're going to tune in our nervous system more to the point. So that way we're ready as sensory, what the senses that sit in our body is ready to receive that experience. And that way then we go into those experiences differently. We can have conversations about those experiences. So when I used to, instead of come, when my children used to come home from school, I didn't say to them, how was your day? Because I knew what I was getting. Fine. Nothing. Yeah, yeah, what did you fine. learn? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, we can play that one back. We could have a record. Yeah. Hit play now, they're about to walk in the door. But so I used to say to them, what experience did you have today? rather than what did you learn in maths? What did you learn in English? Because they've forgotten it. The brain has actually managed to file that information away mm -hmm. for when it needs it next time. It's learned mm -hmm. that piece of information. But if I say to you, what experience did you have today? Then the children, it's interesting, just try it out because it's fascinating. They actually come up with a totally different response. Well, actually, I did this today, you know, or yeah. I did that today. So it's just mm -hmm. interesting how... Yeah we use our language slightly in a different way, we get a very different response coming back. Oh, so true. That is yeah. so true. And I think having questions that 
require an answer yeah. is so much better. I know families that at the dinner table, and they actually like sat and ate at the dinner table. I highly yeah. recommend it, parents. Anyway, yeah, yeah. they would ask things like, what was the best thing that happened to you today? What was yeah. the worst thing that happened to you today? Uh, who helped you today? Tell me about someone who helped you today. Tell me about okay. someone that you helped today. You know, yeah. having those kinds of questions that require a response and that the kids get to expound on, especially yeah. when they're younger. If you're including them in that conversation, they will be more willing to stay at the table after they yeah. wolf down their food, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. having them be a part of all of that. So yeah, what a great recommendation. I highly yeah. agree with you. Yeah, and the other one I really love to language very differently is behavior. That word in our family is actually banned. We have the word behavior and we have a crossed out because to me, there is actually no such thing. Well, there is. It's the outcome that we see from our emotions. So mm -hmm. I have the word behavior crossed out and underneath it, I have the word emotion because then I say, we, I just noticed that that was a rather large emotion at the present moment. And sometimes I don't use words. I actually like to communicate non-verbally. So oh, if my yeah. young person's having a emotional moment at that point in time, what I actually like to do is, and I like to set myself up to be a calm, centered and focused person because that way, once again, those mirror neurons are working for mm -hmm. me. So how I set myself up in that way, going into that emotional moment, is how the child will receive my energy. So that way he knows, they know that I'm coming in to support them. So yes. all of a sudden their emotion lessens at that point in time. I don't, as the parent, take on the emotion. And that's what we love to do as parents. You know, when I yeah. first had my little Vegemites, <laughs> oh, give me that's those so emotions, give them to me, because I don't <laughs> want you to experience any of that. They're, right. they're not nice things. I'm not going to get you to to take on that, you know, to experience yeah. that. Yeah. You know, we just Anger, want to take sadness, it on. disappointment. Yeah, give it to me. Okay, and I'll then after a while... Yeah, take it all. Let me take it all. But after I had four children, I went, hmm, actually, I don't want any of your emotions. I actually want you to have them all back. Yes. <laughs> Here they go. I'll have them all back to you now, one by one. Let Remember that emotion? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that one. You can have them all back now. Yeah. Um, but what I like to do is actually just be in that calm, centered, focused way with them and then just sit with them. You know, at a nice, comfortable distance, depending on who the child is. Some like us closer than others. Yeah. And then sometimes what I say to them when I'm ready to be in that talking space, I'll either say, you know, wow, your body just had this reaction or your brain just had this reaction. Or I'll say, that was a lot of energy. And that's mm -hmm. another topic I teach when it comes to resilience, because what we really need to understand is we need to understand their thinking and how that works for them and have conversations around our thinking. But we also need to understand energy. Now, not a lot of people teach energy, and I teach it by three ways. I teach high energy, centered energy, and low energy. Excellent. Because our energy within our body, each has a different purpose and a different reason for being yes. here. Yes, yes. And of course, those emotions sometimes are very high, like volcanoes, because they've all been in our body for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. When they're in our body, there is only one direction they're coming. If they've been unresolved, it's not this way. It's that nice volcano effect that we see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because of that emotion, that energy can no longer sustain in our body, and it has to come out. So what we're actually seeing in that space is not our emotion coming out. It looks like that from the outside because mm -hmm. that's what we're seeing. That's the outcome. And that's why some people go, oh, that was a big behavior or that was a big emotion. But actually what it is, that was a big lot of energy that just needed to come out of your body. So yeah. I'd say to, say to them, go, wow, that was a lot of energy stored in your body. You know, and the little person sits there and go, yeah, it was. Yeah. You know, and I said, isn't it great now that, that energy is out of your body? So I teach children how to release energy differently within their bodies. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, they're actually understanding their emotions more. Yeah. And then we can eventually get to that labeling of that emotion and look, linking that to the experience and all of those things. And that's how we become resilient. We can become resilient when we understand how our thinking links to our emotions, which links to our energy, which links to the experiences that we're having. Yes. And then so we've resolved them all by that stage, by having a different conversation. And I use a... Um, a conversation framework called PACE, which is playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, and engaging. Yes. We want to come into the conversation in a playful, fun way 
because that's how we get that connection. The unconscious mind gets relaxed. Oh, great. She's coming in to be with me in, in a fun and engaging way. Mm-hmm. And the whole mechanisms, the defenses just go. It's a beautiful process to watch. Yeah. Then accepting. Wow, that was a little bit tricky, wasn't it? Or oh, wow, that was mm-hmm. a lot of energy. You know, just accepting mm-hmm. the moment for what it is. Yeah. And curiosity. I'm really curious what your body and brain was experiencing, one or the other generally. Mm-hmm. Coming into that curious, we're starting now to come into a conversation mode. So playfulness and acceptance doesn't necessarily have to be conversational, though they can. I actually, in playfulness, I love play. I spy with my little eye because it just snaps <laughs> out really quickly. I spy with my space. little eye. A little guy that's out of control. <laughs> <laughs> Something not quite like so- <laughs> Sorry, I'm having fun with it. <laughs> I, I know, I know. But, you know, <laughs> but see how it just takes you into a different place. Yeah. It all of a sudden shifts. Your energy has shifted from that emotion into a very different space. So now we can start having a conversation. Yeah. And then, of course, I love the last part because it's engaging. You mm-hmm. know, we come back either through a hug or we engage in some way. And sometimes when we have these big resilient moments, we don't often come back through that connection at the end. We sort of get to the curious, oh, I'm curious about what's happening with your body or your brain, but we don't often come back into that nice nonverbal way of just engaging and generally it's a hug. Mm-hmm. Depending on your love language for your child, as I call them, you know, because we either all like, which is all comes back through our senses, we mm-hmm. either like touch, auditory, seeing, whatever that is for that person. There's a different love language for all of us and knowing that about our child is really, really important part of that process. And then what we have is a very resilient child and a very resilient family Mm -hmm. because we're having different conversations in a different way that is able to connect us both, So, which is really awesome. Yeah. And let me know what you think about this. One of the things that I have encouraged my families that I do my coaching with and stuff is to have at least once a week meetings where we're talking about these types of topics but where everybody is calm it's okay to have a little rice crispy treat for everyone or whatever you know and make it a little fun and include games but even do some role playing and when the kids are little when they're three four five six they love that role play let them be the parent and you be the angry child and you practice What's a good way? You show me your ideas of what might be a good way if your brother comes in and just takes away your iPad. I hate iPads. I hate the screens. Or the toys that you're playing with or they push you off the swing or whatever it is. And you can use scenarios from during the week that actually happened in your family. But it's not when you're in the middle of it. And so now we're talking about those very same things, that pace where we're talking about, well, what's going on and what's the emotions? How do you feel when somebody, and we aren't going to say when Joey comes, you know, but if somebody comes and pushes you off the swing and, well, how do you feel when you have to wait too long to get on the swing and someone's hogging it and you've been waiting and waiting, you know, and so you can have those conversations that are away from the moment, the heat of the moment. And That's then it. as you practice them, That's right. you know, with practice comes, well, not perfection, but <laughs> mastery maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? oh, absolutely. And- that's why I teach everything from a skill perspective. I love the way you said right. that because, you know, and there are so many philosophies out there I understand than theories mm-hmm. around emotions and thinking and whether it's a skill or not a skill. But I actually teach it from a skill base because yeah. when we actually learn the skill of thinking, we can actually master the skill of thinking, which yes. then we can self-master and that's where self-mastery comes from. Same with emotions. Mm-hmm. We can actually teach it as a skill. We mm-hmm. can master the skill of emotions once again, mm-hmm. we've got self-mastery because everything comes back to ourselves. When we, sk- when we do the skill of energy, we can learn that skill. We can learn it. We can practice it. We've mastered it. Once yeah. again, self-mastery. So what I love doing, and, and from even from the young stage, is teaching young children about self-discovery. Because when I was younger, <laughs> there was no such thing. So I learned about self-discovery in my 30s, 40s, 50s. <laughs> and we all go on these beautiful self-discovery journey, journeys as teenagers or adults. But we actually don't stop and think, actually, my child needs to self-discover who they are yeah. as they're growing up from a three-year-old to a four-year-old to a five-year-old because yeah. it's a journey we're learning all the time. Mm-hmm. Why not learn about ourselves? Why not learn mm-hmm. about our emotions and celebrate it? Across the world, we're in this really unique space of not really loving our mental health, not mm-hmm. really loving our social emotional development. For me, 
I just want to celebrate our mental health. Let's have these most amazing positive conversations that we can, all about our brain, all about our body, and really understand what's happening. And it was so funny because I've got four children, one girl, three boys, and I went through the era when I was studying, I went through the era, boys didn't do emotions, right? So then I came, we came full circle and we went, boys, it's okay for boys to cry. You know, we went through that yeah. era. Yeah. We just need to be connected to their emotions. So I was all over it. I was one of those cool mums. I was on top of it. Three boys. I was going to know about their emotions with every eye roll I got. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> and I was using the wrong language because that was the language that was around at the time. That's what we were all doing. Right. Anyway, we went through that era and I got really connected. The boys got really connected with their emotions. I'm sure they loved me. But then they became <laughs> they became in about late teenagers, early 20s, and I'm still studying neuroscience, blah, 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 mm-hmm. you know, and it goes, boys, I've got it wrong. And I went, oh, what did you do? I said, I don't just want to know about your emotions. I actually want to know about your thinking too. And they go, yeah. oh, really? Jeez, go, mom. Yeah, jeez, yeah. mom. You know, but that was a big shift for us. Yeah. Because, you know, some of those, that thinking that wasn't quite healthy or that thinking, no, I wasn't quite unsure, actually started coming out. So the conversations mm-hmm. we were still having around our thoughts mm-hmm. and because we often stop and feel, and like the way you said before, I feel. I actually don't use the words I feel. I, Depending on the child, I use I think. So instead of saying, how do you feel when Johnny comes over? How do you think mm-hmm. it's going to go when Johnny comes over? Because yeah. what I need you to be is not in your body feeling at that moment. I need you to be up in your, in your mind brain. thinking. Yeah, yeah. So tell me what you think about when Johnny's going to come over. Mm-hmm. Because then I'm not stirring up any emotion that may be sitting there in the body around what Johnny right. may or may not do when he comes over. Right. I'm not bringing that up. I'm putting you right. into a thinking space and going, mm, how do you think this might work for us? Yeah. Um, so the emotion, if it's there, is going to stay there until we can release it at some other point in time. Because with children, we either sometimes unknowingly guilty as yeah. as I come. Oh yeah. We put children into a feeling space rather than a thinking space. Mm. So it's really important sometimes to go, hmm, is this a feeling situation or a thinking situation? Where do I want the child? When I work with teachers in schools, because mm-hmm. I use teach in schools as well with teachers and I say, hmm, mm-hmm. children are learners. We want them to be thinking. Sometimes teachers, unbeknownst, and I was a teacher in the same boat, I would put my children into a feeling space and then all of a sudden we'd get behavior. What is mm-hmm. behavior is emotions because I've used my words to put them into a feeling space. They're doing their emotions. Outcome is behavior. So, but the poor child is now being punished for that behavior <laughs> where in essence, it's actually coming right back to the language sometimes we use that puts mm-hmm. them into that space. So I say to teachers, and what are we here to learn in school for? Learning. So do you want your children in a feeling space or a thinking space? Mm-hmm. And they go, well, I just want them to think all day long. Go, great. Let's use words that put them into that thinking space right. rather than using their words to put you into a feeling space. And right. I do lots of exercises around that. And kids really get that concept really, really yeah. quite good. Yeah. And sometimes they go, I want you to, <laughs> I've got one little child who's just the most beautiful little person who goes up to his teacher and he says I just want to be thinking all day today no feeling (laughs) in other words please don't use your thinking words today because I really don't want to go into it and the teacher's just amazing yeah and and how they process that and they wow that is so cool so cool so what if though you have a child that is yeah. living entirely in mm-hmm. their feeling space. And so everything yeah. is huge. Everything is huge. Yeah. Everything is a disaster. Everything is. Yeah. And you're trying to help them get into that. But the child themselves is being kind of resistant yeah. to that because they are that super emotional yeah. child. What suggestions? Yeah. Where that actually comes from is the nervous system. So when you've got a really highly emotional child, what that says to me is your nervous system is actually overloaded. So okay. what I actually do first, and I do it through music, and actually it's, it's an American product I actually use, and it was right. developed by... T- yeah, yeah, which is really cool. I do a lot of shopping in, in the US. It's amazing okay. how much shopping I do over there. 
The postage is not so great, let me tell you. No. But So I have to buy a little bit of bulk occasionally. <laughs> and then I still have to watch my dollar, but I'm all good to go with that. Because it's based on music and that actually tunes in the nervous system. So sometimes we actually have to look as to what's actually sitting underneath that before we can actually go there. So I mm-hmm. would say to them, I'm noticing your sensory system. And sometimes I use those words with children because I have taught them what that is. It's just a little bit overloaded at the present moment. And basically, they're going to go into a different room and go through those those emotional spaces. But I also only ever use thinking words. So they're not going to go into that feeling space. Mm-hmm. So when we do uh, practice it with your words, practice around, I'm only going to use thinking words. I'm not going to use feeling words and see the difference and get them used to that. Because then the whole body and the whole brain goes, oh. She actually doesn't want me to feel. She actually wants me to think. Mm-hmm. So, and even just changing your language. And sometimes they just I, don't even know how to do that. Think. No. They don't know how That's to just exactly think. Right. And they don't know how That's to throw right. away that. So we're helping them. And I think you brought up kind of a good point is that we're starting with that. It's nothing yeah. that's going to happen in an afternoon or no. overnight or in a week or maybe no. even a year. And in fact, these are the lessons that we're going to be teaching them really throughout their lives as their bodies change, as their hormones change, as their That's brain it. chemistry changes, right? That's it. That's exactly how it works. But the moment they can twig into what's happening in their brain and the body, they make those adjustments better in time, which is yes. really cool. And when they understand that nervous system is overloaded or not overloaded, they have the strategies then to be able to regulate that nervous system so much better. And that's mm-hmm. what they know that they're doing. And then they bring themselves into that nice, calm, centered, focused way. And then all of a sudden they're doing what they need to be doing. So it's just re-educating and re-teaching children about what's happening for them. And those emotions then will quite lessen quite quickly in that space. But once again, he needs to know he's an emotional little fish and that's okay at times as well. Yeah. And <laughs> where your body's going to go first, it's going to go to your emotions first. And then he gets the hang of that, oh, I'm going to go to that emotional place first. And then I'm going to need some help to come back into this thinking space. And when I work with young children, because I'm really a bit clever at this, because I've had lots and lots of practice. <laughs> I love it's, that. It's like, yeah, it's I swap them in and out. I go, oh, I'm going to put you into emotional space. I'm going to put you into thinking. And I play this little game with their nervous system. So the nervous system gets used to swapping. Oh. So because the new nervous system is only used to being in that one state of feeling. It also right. goes with energy as well. So for children who experience attentional deficit disorder, ADHD, attentional deficit hyperactivity order, their body is stuck in high energy. What yeah. their body hasn't learned yet is to go from high to centered to low, low to centered to high, high to centered to low. Mm-hmm. It's predominantly stuck in high energy. Yes. So when I teach... When I teach young children, I go, hmm, notice, notice you got stuck in high gear. Once again, I go to the car, you're stuck in, your body is stuck in high gear. Yep, and sometimes I just want to bring those gears back down, come back down from fourth to third to second to the first, you know. Mm-hmm, but their body mm-hmm. hasn't learned that process. So I teach them that process and they go, oh, wow, this is really cool. And then I go, how clever are you? You're an energy shifter. You've just shifted your energy. And then I go... Go and do it with other people because when we learn something, the best way to really learn it is to teach it to others. Yeah. So then I say, What a good point. So, and kids love doing that. Like you were saying before, do it in play scenarios, you know, or or do it in role plays. Kids love nothing better than to be in a teaching role. And I put children into teaching roles all the time, even Mm -hmm. as young as three years of age. Like I've got little Mm -hmm. grandchildren that are that age at the present moment. They naturally want to play mum and dads. They naturally want to play school and shop. So yeah, I'll they say, do. Yeah, yeah. So I just say to them, I'm going to teach you this. You go and teach that to somebody else. <laughs> and the next minute they've got all their little friends and preschool or prep. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that's a good thing for them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. because the more we teach, the more we learn. And our brain is understanding the information on such a deeper level when we teach it. And we're all natural teachers. Yep, we have a profession called teaching. But to me, we are all teachers. Mm -hmm. I actually author under LK Tommy. LK is my initials because I never quite really saw myself as an author. So LK, my initials, Lynn Kendall. And then Tommy stands for teacher of me, myself and I. Because in my book... Yeah, so in my book, and I've got one here, which is called The Ultimate Experience, because I believe we're all here wow. for the ultimate experience in life. And that's why we're on planet Earth, is to have the most ultimate experience. And I also believe, and in the book, they all dis- also discover that they can become a Tom. 
because uh, Tom actually stands for teacher of me, because we can all teach ourselves about our body. We can all teach ourselves about our brain. This book starts from about seven or eight years of age, and I'm writing a younger series. I've written my teenage series as well, because you're totally right. As we move through the (laughs) world of being a human, our experiences change, you know, so the teenage books looks very differently to what my seven-year-old books look like. And then I'm writing a series for the younger children. So it's that way the parents can read the stories. And this each character in the younger series, each character will have their own book. Oh, fun. So, yeah, yeah. So which is really cool. So yeah. Dragon will go and explore emotions with you. Turtle does oxygen. Monkey does energy because monkeys. Of energy. course he does. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> what else is That's he going exactly to do? Right. Yeah. And of course, Al does thinking because Al's just calm, set and focused and sitting in his tree all day anyway, searching out to the, to, the, to the wild yonder. So, well, and we're going to have all of that information down in the show notes. So yeah, if absolutely. any of our people are interested in that, they can just go on down and click and yeah. we'll have that already. So yeah. I know our time is coming yeah, to an end, no but I wanted to just ask one last thing. Very yep. often in our families, the adults are struggling. <laughs> With their thinking brain and their emotional brain and their body and all of that. Is there any suggestions or sometimes it's very hard for the adults to recognize, wow, I'm the one that's struggling. We all throw it on the kids or the dog or whatever, stupid dog. What's going on with you? And not with a judgmental or, but again, that curiosity piece saying, wow, I really used a lot of energy right there. Why do I think I did that? What was setting me up for that moment? So do you have any suggestions maybe for parents who are trying to come in tune with their own energy systems? Oh, absolutely. I like to teach being a calm, centered and focused parent. It's once again, it's understanding. And I call it the calm, centered and focused parenting style. I think I created a new one. But anyway, because what we need to do sometimes is actually bring our body, once again, doing that body awareness, you know, getting that diaphragmic breathing, getting that oxygen circulating around our body. So I don't talk about deep breathing because what our body actually needs is the oxygen circulating around our body. If I say to the unconscious mind, we're going to go do some breathing patterns now, the unconscious mind goes, oh, no, I'm already breathing. So, you know, I'm alive. (laughs) So obviously, I don't need to listen round about now. But if I say to the unconscious mind, what we're going to do is circulate the oxygen right around our body and we're going to use our diaphragm, we're going to circulate that oxygen right around our body, the unconscious mind goes, yep, that diaphragm is sleeping and I don't have enough oxygen. And that's the one skill that, and it's often the very first skill I teach even to children. And as part of that tuning up of the body process, it's really making sure we've got enough oxygen because where emotions also come from, number one, they're stored in our nervous system and in our body, but it's also from our breathing. If I'm breathing from the chest, I'm cutting off the oxygen supply to my brain and the brain goes, I've got no clue what you want me to do because I don't have enough oxygen to think. (laughs) And we actually don't think about that our brain actually needs oxygen, but it actually does need oxygen. So that's it. Mm -hmm. So being able to get that oxygen flowing right the way through our body, right through our fingertips, right through to our toes, right up to our brain. And then we're always in thinking mode as well. We're actually not in feeling mode. So that way we can tune ourselves in through getting that oxygen release in our body, knowing where our oxygen is in our body and being aware whether it's in our chest or whether it's in our diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And that way the parent going into any of those situations, if they've got enough oxygen in their body and they've got those breathing elements happening for them, they're always Mm -hmm. going to be in a situation where they can help the little ones. I love that analogy. You know, put on your life life mask first before you can help somebody else. Right. Yeah, yeah. We need to do that as parents. And that's why I love doing the whole family tune-up system. There's nothing better than working with the whole family and just putting these practices in together that just makes sense and languaging it so the brain understands and the body understands exactly what it is that you're doing. I love the term meditation. I love the term mindfulness. But actually what we're doing is actually circulating the oxygen right around our body in that point in time. We're bringing our body back to a sense of stillness, taking us to low energy. We're then circulating the oxygen around our body so our brain can come back into a thinking space. And then we can go about our daily process just being a calm, safe parenting style. What do you think? I think that that's exactly right. And you're spot on with getting that going. And I love starting with the breathing, but the moving oxygen. (laughs) We're going to start with moving that oxygen around in our bodies. 
That's right. And we don't have to sit still moving that oxygen around our bodies. Go oh, no. with their learning styles. If you've got a highly kinesthetic child who loves movement, get them mm -hmm. to jog up and down on the spot. That gets the oxygen flowing mm -hmm. through the body. I've actually put together, which just happened all by accident, but I love accidents. <laughs> I, yeah, It's not actually up on my website yet because I literally created it last week. But it's wow. actually a movement. Yeah, it's actually a movement. How am I going to describe it? You actually, it's music and I talk you through the process and then you move with the process. And what I find that actually release the oxygen right the way through their body, but it gets the whole body and yeah. nervous system coming yeah. nicely into alignment as well. And we've been playing around with it here and we've been doing it every single morning and with the grandkids as well as they come past my door before they go to school. Let's do that. You know, let's get that groove on. So it's yeah. not about sitting in stillness and getting that oxygen flowing. It's whatever works for you as parents. If, mm -hmm. your, if your thing is to move and get that oxygen flowing, awesome, do it that way. If your yeah. thing is to be still, awesome, do it that way. So, you know, what I love teaching children as well as what their learning style is, and then we match everything to that. And understanding is it auditory, is it visual? Yeah. Sometimes, because our behavior comes from an overloaded sense. So if I know, and it's, for me, it's visual. So what I have to actually do is when I'm coming, I'm noticing a change in my body, I actually have to close my eyes and use my hearing sense because my eyes sense is overloaded. Mm. So I need to cut, tune in through my ears at that point yeah. in time. Now, if it, my hearing sense is overloaded, what I need to do is actually close off my hearing sense, put noise cancelling headphones on and come to something that's going to focus me with my eyes. Right. So everything still comes back to our body. Yeah. It still comes back to how our senses interact with what's actually happening for us and within ha ha happening in our body, which is why I love teaching about the body and the brain. How cool are Perfect. we? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, okay, so if our listeners and watchers want to learn more about you, get to your website, yep. where are they going to go? You're going to go to www.theresilienceshooter.com.au and connect with me through there. You can also connect with me through LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram as well. But I just love to chat. I'm really bad at it. <laughs> I noticed. No. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so feel free just to hook up and have a chat as well. You, because Lovely. sometimes I can just help you in small ways. I do have programs. I do have books as well. But let's just start having the conversations and see mm -hmm. where those conversations flows. It's exactly how I work in that space as well. But uh, yeah, no, I'm just excited to share what I've learned and what I know yeah with with families now and that's my love i mean i do love teaching back in schools so there's nothing better than standing in front of 25 children and teaching all of these You're skills right. but i also just love coming into your family home and have whole poly resources so if you do come through my programs you do get up. the resilience student ends up on your fridge you know <laughs> um, yep. because it's just all nicely resourced and that way the kids go and I just send the kids to the fridge. Hmm. Which mm. part? Because I do a whole diagrams around the healthy brain and what keeps right. that brain. Because when one of those elements are actually out, that means we'll go into an emotional space or a tricky life experience will happen for us. So mm. I, I point to the one on the fridge and go, which one of these do you think's missing? <laughs> and it's interesting. Yeah. They'll go, I think it's this one. I think I'm missing this one. I haven't had right. enough oxygen enough fresh air, enough oxygen. So, yeah. you know, and you just hand it over to the kids and it's just exciting. Let They're them amazing. discover themselves and they know. They just haven't been given a language or a framework sometimes right. to be able to work with. So, and that's what I love providing. Absolutely. So anyway, as you can tell, I can keep talking all day. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. And that's fine. Except I run out yeah. of time. So yeah, but yeah, I love exactly. it. I love it. So before we go, though, I do want to ask you, I ask all my guests this question. Anyone who's listening, they know what's coming next. There are no perfect parents. They don't exist. But that's with that correct. in mind, how would you describe maybe a successful parent? Either my calm-centered or focused parent is a successful parent or a parent who makes mistakes. And it's so funny you said that because I've actually just written a blog about that because mistakes are awesome. It's all about the teaching, you know, and even the tricky life experiences and understanding those tricky life experiences is a successful parent as well because, you know, I have children now saying, I've just had a tricky life experience and I've learned this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, the successful parent is the learning parent because yeah. every experience that we have on this planet Earth is a learning experience. It's here mm -hmm. to teach us something. It's mm -hmm. either going to teach us about ourselves, the situation that we're in, or it's going to teach us about somebody else. But it also yeah. teaches us about us as a growth as a person. 
that's what we're here to do. We're here to grow and evolve as the best person that we can be and do whatever it is that we need to do in this wonderful world of ours and find our passion, find our person. So to me, the most successful parent is the learning parent. Parent is open to and embracing Every single mistake. I actually want to put that word mistake and actually cross it out as well. Yes. Because it's a learning experience. It's a learning experience. And I've done this. I've listened to a lot of people who've made a ton of money, right? Yeah, yeah. They always say fail first. Yes, yeah. Isn't it funny? I learned way more from my failures than I did my successes. Yeah, yeah. And so so we need to give that grace to ourselves. We also need to give it to our kiddos. For our students Absolutely. or whomever we're working yep. with, but you are so right on. Lynn Kendall, yep. thank you so much for helping us out and teaching us just a little yeah. more. And again, all of the information that we're talking about is all down in the show notes. And while you're there, just, you know, yeah. click follow, subscribe. You can leave a rating and review. Five stars is the appropriate number of stars. <laughs> <Love> <laughs> and say DJ is crazy and a lunatic and I love her guests. Anything that you want to say about that, but it always helps us get the message out to more families. And isn't that what we want? And so until next week, let's find joy in parenting. Bye, guys. Yeah.